I'm Katie Barr. Um, I'm currently a technical consultant at the Test People, though only for the next week, um, where I mostly do cool stuff in Python. Before that, I did a PhD in quantum information, where I also did some cool-ish stuff with Python. Um, so today, I'm going to tell you about that, because I think it's fantastic that something that a lot of people find so intimidating, um, if you have a tiny bit of Python knowledge, like becomes really easy to simulate and play about with, and you can properly learn what superposition means, what amplitude means, you can see interference phenomena, you can see measurement. So it's my way of trying to get my love of quantum physics over to the masses. So um, we're going to talk to you about a particular um, model which is called the quantum walk and I'll tell you about that in quite some detail so that hopefully when we get to the simulation, which I'm going to rush over a little bit because you can all just email me and ask if you <laughs> want the details, um, I'm going to try and convince you that this is an interesting thing to study um, by showing you some really cool applications and you with the simulation I give you, uh, you can go away and do research that is publishable. Like, I published research on something that's almost identical to what I go, th go through with you today um, about two years ago. So this isn't a trivial system. This is something that is an open topic of research. So I'm not just giving you a baby thing to make it easy, all right? I'm giving you something that is still of interest to the quantum information community. So, the quantum walk is hopefully what you guessed it was, which is the quantum analogue of the classical random walk. Um, and they're both really similar. So, you have a coin operation and a shift operation. So, in the classical random walk, you just flip your coin, that tells you whether you go left or right. And then you apply your shift operation, which is simply a permutation. Um, and then you repeat that for as many steps as you like. They can both take place on arbitrary structures, so the most uh, obvious example is the line, but you can really run this on anything. Um, they can both be modelled in continuous and discrete time, and which one you choose really depends on what you want to do. So people looking to model physical phenomena tend to look at continuous time versions of things because the flow of time is continuous. Um, computer scientists, we're all used to like computational steps of chawing machines and stuff like that, so we tend to look at things more in discrete time. And they're both really easy to simulate, okay? The classical random walk on the line was the first piece of code I ever wrote. The piece of code I'm going to show you today is the third piece of code I ever wrote. So you don't need any skill whatsoever, which for me I found quite useful. Um, so why did we do this? Um, so classical random walks are used in loads of algorithms. They're really, really useful. Quantum computers are known to be fast, um, but it's not enough to know that we have this fast computing system, we need to be, do, be able to do things with it, so we need to be able to develop algorithmic tools. And, like, where do you look for, for algorithmic tools? We're quite lazy in academia, we usually think someone's had an idea before, so we'll just go and nick theirs. So we thought classical random walks, yeah, they're really useful, maybe we'll make a quantum analog of that, and that might be useful. And it turns out it is. Like, if you have pro pretty much any problem in computer science can be mapped or already has a mapping to this paradigm. So, um, it's already proven algorithmically useful, now we just need to build a quantum computer to run them on, which I'll also say these exist in the lab. The thing I'm showing you today has, has been run. So, if you can turn your problem into something like this, then you might not need to wait around for us to build quantum computers. You might be able to like, modify an existing experiment and that will do your computation for you. So, I think that's pretty cool. Um, but hopefully I'll convince you by the end of the talk. Uh, so, the system is defined, and this goes for all of quantum mechanics, is vectors, matrices and operators. Operators are simply a mapping from a vector space to another vector space. Um, in this case, we're actually mapping from a vector space to um, the same vector space. 
And I'll use the word system later quite a lot. And to me, a system is just a vector in a vector space. So please don't be confused by that. So I need to tell you a tiny bit about quantum mechanics. Um, so I'll be talking about amplitude. This is what you use to calculate probabilities. Um, we usually denote it alpha. And it's a complex number, and that's really important because controlling interference um, is what gives us a lot. Um, it, a lot of quantum algorithms are based on the ability to quant control interference. So if you didn't have these complex numbers, which if you've done any sort of wave mechanics ever, it's just the phase, um, then you wouldn't get a lot of the richness of quantum systems. So. Um, we have unitary operators, and this just means validly quantum mechanical. Um, so they're time reversible. Um, probability has to be conserved because otherwise it doesn't make much physical sense. And orthogonal states are mapped to orthogonal states. So I've been told that um, in principal component analysis you have a similar mapping. So if any of you have done that, then you can probably think of these in a language that's much more better known to you. So we have the coin state. And the reason for that is to make the system reversible. Um, people originally tried to make quantum analogues of classical random walks by just summing up paths. But if you're at position 5 after, tie, uh, after time, 10 time steps and you have no information about where stuff has come from, you don't know which path, which parts of your amplitude have come from, then you can't reverse it. So the quantum, the coin state is what preserves the uh, sort of memory of where you've been and enables you to time reverse it. And a time step is literally just a multiplication of the state vector by the time evolution operator. Um, so all we're doing here is matrix multiplication, apart from I'm not going to show it to you like that because I promised I'm doing this in Python with no imports. Um, so, but fundamentally, that is all that you're doing. Um, so the quantum walk model. Um, for an arbitrary graph, so this is just a set of edges and vertices, we have a coin operator. This acts locally at each vertex, and don't worry, I'll show you this in uh, more concrete terms on the next slide. Um, and it just has to be any unitary operator. If you have irregular graphs, so graphs where there are different numbers of edges going into different vertices, then obviously you need a different coin applied at every node. Um, and then we have the shift operator that is simply a permutation. So that's saying if we're at the eighth coin state of node V, then after we've applied the shift, then um, we are at the eighth coin state of node U. And permutation matrices are always unitary. So um, just because there's zero, one matrices everywhere. So um, to make this a little bit more concrete, I have a little diagram here. So, say we're starting our walk and we're putting all the amplitude into our system through this edge here. So, we're all at the coming from the top coin state at vertex 1. Um, we'll apply our coin operator and we're going to assume it's a non-trivial coin operator. So, that's going to give us amplitude in all three coin states here. Um, and then when we apply our shift, the amplitude in this coin state that's going to the right is just going to be swapped with the amplitude in this coin state at node 2, which is going to the left. So hopefully <coughs> you're all following so far, but um, I'll make it a bit more concrete again. So we're going to be doing it on the lattice. And that's so that we can use something called the 4D Grover operator. and well, I'll show you later why that's cool. Um, but um, so um, this we're going to start in an equal in magnitude superposition. So here, superposition is just a combination of basis states. That just means you're in a combination of you've come from up, right, left, and down all at once. And I've written it out in Dirac notation, which um, is what quantum information theorists use. Um, this, they're just vectors. 
Um, so, and you combine quantum systems by taking a tensor product. And the tensor product is pretty much like a full outer join on a database. So I'm pretty sure that all of you have done one of those at some point. And I make that analogy because then hopefully you can see why these things grow really quickly as you combine them, and therefore why they're hard to simulate on a classical computer, and therefore why we need quantum computers that have this nature inherently in order to properly um, explore quantum mechanics. So, to get a lattice, we literally just combine a line on the, um, in the um, horizontal direction with a line in the vertical direction, and then we're going to combine that with our position space. So we're going to start like that, and I'll show you that in code in a second. So, the first step, um, we'll have applied our coin here, we'll have done our shift, and we've moved in a combination of all the directions. So, the second step, I hope you can see, I've made this lighter to try and show that there's less amplitude at each position. But um, we have moved a little bit back into the middle, and we've moved outwards as well. And I've kept this diagram um, consistent with the simulation that I'm running. In general, you'd move out to these nodes and the ones at the top as well, but that also wouldn't fit on a slide. But uh, that hopefully gives you an inkling of how you get a quantum speed up with this thing straight away because our classical thing um, you always expect it to just get back to the origin but this thing after two steps it's already spread out um, up to two nodes away from the origin so if you control your initial state and your coin correctly then you can get a very high probability of being measured a long way from the origin in t time steps so it's ballistic transport, um, which is the same in human terms. You're walking in a straight line instead of taking a random walk. So I get onto the tiny bit of code. I don't know what happened to this box at the bottom, sorry. Um, but, um, so we, we have to initialize the array that we're going to walk on and our initial state. So to determine the size, you just decide um, how many steps you want to run the walk for, and double that, because you're going to start from the middle. Um, if you're going to hit the edge, then you're going to have some problems, so you need to take care in that case, either by looping things back to create a sphere, or applying a different operator on the edge. So, in the easiest case, just don't hit the edge. Um, so, literally, all we have is a list of lists, and um, each element in our array is just going to have four values that are the up, down, left, and right amplitudes. So we're going to set that here. Um, I've chosen these particular values because they give some nice evolution that's very distinctive. Um, so that's a good way of telling if your simulation is correct. Pick something that you know is going to give you very distinctive evolution. So to do the time step, because you have a regular lattice, like you actually, you know where amplitude is going to end up from each position. You know it can only go up from a certain coin state in your current position or down from a certain coin state. So instead of having to do matrix multiplication, you just initialize a new array to um, give you, to put your intermediate um, amplitudes in and for ease of following, um, I've just made some assignments here. So we're saying the zero state is going left, the two state is going right, um, and then one and three are up and down. And here, um, these A's are 0 0.5, by the way, because this is uh, just the operator that we're giving. And we're basically applying the coin flip all at once here. Um, so, I'll show you the matrix version of this operator very shortly, but if you remember matrix multiplication, you just take one row and then you multiply it by your vector, and then that gives you the component there. So, this, our vector, is left up, right, down, and our row of our matrix is minus A, 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 A. So, we're just doing that directly, and that is going to go into the left coin state at uh, our new position zero. So, just run that for 40, 50 steps, and you've done your walk. And so, I wanted to show you um, 
just again what we're actually doing mathematically at each node. So this is the four dimensional Grover operator which is famous due to Grover's algorithm which I'll show you very shortly and so see here our A's were 0.5 so I really was just taking this row of this matrix and multiplying it by these components here. So that's our first step just written out for you after the coin flip and then these are what get shifted into the new positions here. Okay so there's not really a huge amount of point in running a simulation if you're not going to look at the results of it. Um, so in order to get the results, we're not really interested in the coin state. Um, we only want to know the probability of being in a certain position. Um, and the way you calculate that is by using the something called the Born Rule. Um, and this is just saying to the probability of being measured in state i is the projection of your state vector onto the subspace i and then the multiplication of that by the conjugate transpose of your state vector. So programmatically that's literally just the, this here. You times your amplitude by its complex conjugate. So just loop over all positions and then you have your probability distribution at the end. So I'll show you some example dynamics and I would recommend if you're interested in this that you go away and sort of look at this yourself because it's really interesting but um, or to me it is anyway. But um, This is the simulation that I've told you about. So you'll see this is dramatically different to the other two, which I'll get to in a second. You have this high peak. I don't know if you can read these values here, but this is 0 0.4. This is 0 0.04, and that's 0 0.04. So this peak is 10 times larger than the highest peaks of these two, and you get these sort of waves traveling outwards as well. And your choice of initial condition determines how much uh, probability stays in the center and how much probability moves outwards. So I've shown you these for comparison. This is the discrete Fourier transform. So hopefully you've all come across Fourier analysis. This is really hard to see here. You need to really have the graph in front of you and twiddle it about. But this is something called the Hadamard operator, which is just the 2D tr Fourier transform. Um, applied to the left and right and up and down directions. And what you actually get, I told you that to make a lattice, you just combine a line in one direction and then a line in another direction. If you act just on those directions, then if I flip this over, you'd see a cross like this. You've really just got lines going in two directions. So um, that's because you don't have entanglement between the um, sort of left and right and up and down directions. So entanglement is just a property of systems when you interact with them. They, um, they become, well, they become just one system. You can't really consider them as a single system anymore. Um, but it's also useful to look at because you can treat that as a computational resource. So. If you want to analyze this, there are, it really depends on what you're looking for, but um, you can look at the shape of the distribution. So I've told you, I've shown you a couple of different shapes you can get. Um, you can see how different features of the coin contribute, so it's really hard to show on a static slide, but I told you entanglement between left and right and up and down directions makes quite a big difference. Um, you can look for things like rotational symmetry, or you can just look at things like the expected um, distance from the mean if you're interested in transport properties. It really depends why you're running the simulation. And also, again, it's probably too complicated complicated to go on now, but entanglement between coin and position can be quite interesting. So I've pretty much just said everything on, on this slide. Um, so um, there are different transport properties that you can look at depending on what you want from your walk. So perfect state transfer is literally just going completely from A to B. In some architectures of quantum computers, you need that to get your quantum state to the next stage of the computation. So there's a lot of um, work in that. Um, 
or if you're more interested in modeling physical phenomena, then um, you'll do it with the continuous time walk in general. Um, that tends to be really difficult, so I would argue against it. Um, if you're interested in algorithmic properties, then generally you'll write your algorithm and you'll just run the simulation to confirm that you've not messed it up somehow. Um, so, if you actually want to do research with these sorts of things, then um, there are quite a lot of things that you need to do. Um, Referees tend to ask for comparison with the classical case. Um, now, because you have a quadratic speed up in comparison to the classical case, so you need to run, if you run your quantum walk for t steps, you need to run your class classical walk for t squared steps. So my advice would be don't make the quantum one too big because otherwise the referees will come back and ask you to run a simulation that you can't physically do on the hardware you have. Um, you can't just pick random values for the, um, for the initial uh, state and think that you're going to get something that actually represents the um, behavior, sort of aggregated behavior of this system because they're not uniformly distributed. So if you want to look at um, sort of, um, well, properties of things um, that are independent of initial state and therefore run things for lots of initial states, then you need to do some transformations. Um, and because these tend to be computationally intensive, I would say just try not to run simulations because people prefer analytical results anyway. Um, like if, if you think that you've found something by simulation and you don't prove it, then again your referees are just going to come back and say, all right, prove it. So only run simulations if you need. So the way I ran these was with a mathematician and we sort of paired and where he got stuck, I ran some simulations, I'd say go and look at this. And then we sort of had a really good relationship where we encouraged each other and pushed each other on. Um, so try and find a maths guy. <laughs> so to prove to you that what I'm showing you isn't just some trivial thing, um, I wanted to mention Grover's algorithm. So we're using the Grover operator. Um, this is asymptotically the fastest uh, possible way of solving this problem using a quantum computer. So this is an algorithm to search an unsorted database. Um, and classically, you can't do this in less than linear time, which means basically checking everything in a row is as fast as you can get. So it's not too much more work to get from the stuff I've told you about today to Grover's algorithm. Um, so you need to work on a hypercube rather than um, a lattice. And your hypercube, so the things you're looking for are binary strings. And they're binary strings of a given length. And each point on your hypercube represents one of those binary strings. You start in a uniform superposition over all of the nodes on your hypercube. Um, and you apply the Grover coin at every node apart from your marked node, which is the node that actually is the string you're looking for. You run this for a predetermined number of steps, and then you measure the particle position, and there's a very high probability that your particle is going to be where the, um, at the marked state. And if it's not, because this is really fast, then you just run it again. So, in general, quantum computing is probabilistic, so you can't get a, a, com a proper answer out of a single shot of your computation. You need to run it for long enough to actually get the probability distribution. Um, and, but that's not really an issue for quantum information theorists because these things I don't know the numbers, but we generally talk about things um, that evolve in sort of scales of nanoseconds. So if you're doing, and these are for really large things that you can't, like a, hundred, a thousand qubit um, quantum computer would beat a super, modern supercomputer. So um, 
yeah, they're, they're fast. We just need to build one that big, and, um, <laughs> which is a bit of an issue. But, um, so um, I also wanted to show you, because this is cool because it uses the exact operator that I've told you to use as your coin operator. Um, but in a different way. And this is used to prove that quantum walks are computationally universal. So that means that they can simulate anything you like. And the proof has been done via logic gates. So hopefully you're all familiar with the circuit model of computation. Um, and so I'm going to show you two parts of the proof. Um, I also say. Um, Having studied lots of theoretical computer science, in quantum systems it's very easy to get computational universality. So in classical logic systems it is as well. So you can have a single gate that's you the Toffoli gate. So um, it's sort of not surprising if you can turn this into a circuit that it's universal. And so we prove it's universal by showing it can simulate an elementary gate set. So there are a number of ways that you can do that, but roughly it always needs a two qubit gate. So we have qubits instead of bits. So these are our wires. And these, you can tell they're qubits because they're in Dirac brackets. <laughs> and um, so there are a number of ways that you can build a, an elementary gate set, but fundamentally, I mentioned earlier, need, you need to be able to control interference, so you need to have a way of changing the phase of your um, qubit, because that's what um, determines the interference phenomena. Um, and yeah, you need a two qubit gate, because um, otherwise, if you just had a load of qubits all on separate wires, never interacting with each other, then it wouldn't really be a multi qubit computation. So, I'm going to show you. I'm doing really well then, because I'm nearly at the end. Um, I've probably forgotten to say loads of stuff in that case. <laughs> but um, it's all right, we'll have time for questions, so I can fill in the blanks. But, um, so, I'm going to show you how to make the wires. Um, so, previously we were um, applying our operator on something that had amplitude in um, every position, oh, every coin state, um, or just any coin state if you go and um, pass the first step of the simulation. Um, here, there's a property, and this works for all dimensions. If you have um, a, an even dimensional Grover operator, so it's acting on a node of your graph of even degree, and half of the coin states in your node are equal in magnitude and phase, then, so phase is just like a complex coefficient if I'm making if I'm losing people with that but um so um yeah if they're equal in magnitude and phase and half of them are populated then it deterministically transfers all those amplitudes into the previously unpopulated half of your um node so you can use this to build wires that have two inputs coming from one side and two inputs going out the other side um to deterministically um, propagate amplitude across your wires because it wouldn't really be a great circuit if you didn't know where your amplitude was going to be at a given time. You wouldn't know where to apply your logic gates, so it would be pretty useless. So I'm going to show you the simplest logic gate that there is. So you're all, I really hope you're all familiar with the controlled not gate. Um, it's literally you have a control bit or qubit and you have the sort of ancilla bit or qubit and the control bit does nothing but if it's in state one then the ancilla bits um, flipped so if it was a zero before you change it into a one and you do that literally by just crossing these wires so that's, I've, I've shown you these two examples, that Grover's algorithm and the circuit, to show that these quantum walks um, 
have lots of applications in computer science. Um, you can, I did a lot of work on quantum finite automata and they are um, sort of equivalent in quite nice ways to quite a few different quantum finite automata. If you like cellular automata then um, they, there's a really simple transformation that you can do to get from a quantum cellular automaton to a quantum walk. Um, so, and because we know they're universal, like we know basically that there is a mapping from any sort of paradigm of computation to the quantum walk. If someone hasn't worked it out, then unfortunately you'll have to work it out yourself. But um, a lot people have done a lot of work on this. So. Um, now, <laughs> a lot earlier than I uh, anticipated, got to my final slide. Um, so, um, I've introduced the discrete time quantum walk. I really hope that I've made that clear and not garbled it by rushing too much because I was so worried about going over. Um, I showed you how to simulate it on the lattice and I've discussed two applications of quantum walks. Um, just because I have a little bit more time, there was one more I was going to put in that I missed out, which is to me the coolest one, so I'll tell you about that very briefly. Um, this is the continuous time walk rather than the discrete time walk, um, but that just evolves according to the Schrodinger equation, so you don't need 20 lines of Python for that, you need one import and then do um, and then do matrix multiplication, uh, matrix exponation, exponentiation through NumPy. Um, but um, that is that there's this um, antenna complex called the, which exists on photosynthetic bacteria that live in really, really murky, horrible lakes. Um, and these guys, they get one photon per hour. Um, if that photon doesn't go to the reactin reaction center where photosynthesis takes place, it's going to really, really damage the bacteria. Think about what sun does to your skin. Now imagine you're a single-celled organism and you have that amount of energy just floating around in you. It's going to mess things up. So these things are really, really efficient at capturing light. And we have not been able to explain that classically. Um, we recently developed quantum mechanical um, models for that. And when looking at the successful trajectories, um, so light that goes from the antenna into the reaction center to make ATP, then the trajectory is a quantum walk. So I'd say that they're also fundamental to life on Earth. <laughs> but, um, well, we'll see, because I think they did some new experiments and got totally different data than they previously had. So I'm not sure if this is any, any longer true. But um, yeah, so you can use them to model loads of processes. I just talked about computer science, because I did computer science. But, um, so, yeah, I'd also like to thank Calvin Giles for um, trying to help me make this talk um, sort of accessible to you guys. I really, really hope that I've implemented what he said. And then um, Florian and Ian have helped as well. Um, I should have probably put my PhD supervisor on there as well, but you probably don't know her, so it doesn't really matter. Um, so thank you very much for listening. Do you have any questions? Lots of computation systems mapped to that Yeah. So, okay, so I mentioned the uh, quantum cellular automata as well, and then quantum finite automata. Um, there are also so these um, sort of like NAND trees. I don't really know what they are, but um, like people have done work on that. So, those are the three main ones that I know of. Um, and then there are also, rather than particular models of computation, like people have done work to um, implement other algorithms using this as well. So. Since you mentioned uh, set of automata, automata yeah. as, uh, and quantum version of it, has anyone defined uh, or researched on uh, quantum code working applied yet? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, they have. In fact, I really wanted to 
trolled the person doing my Python uh, training course because they had a game of life and I wanted to give them a quantum version. But um, yeah, if you look it up, it's on the archive. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> So when will we be able to buy a quantum computer? Um, <laughs> well, I, I, that really depends. Um, so if you're Google, then you've already bought one. Uh, that was D-Wave. But so people are really mean about D-Wave because they won't show it to anybody. And actually, when they come, so that's. Um, not a universal computer. Um, it does this thing called um, simulated annealing. It takes a month to start up, and then when they compared it to the classical case, it wasn't any faster. So by the time you add the month-long startup time, then you're really a lot slower. So yeah, if you have a billion dollars, then you can buy someone that somebody one that somebody claims is one right now. Um, so as I said already, the um, the walk on the lattice is implemented in the lab already. Um, so if you really wanted to go and buy yourself an optical table, dig down into the foundations of your house and do some fancy stuff so no vibrations get through um, and then get stuff to make sure it can be properly dark and all that stuff, then you could do that now. Um, but yeah, when if you're asking when you'll be able to buy a multi-purpose quantum computer, I I can't tell you that. I think that we'll see a scientific revolution on the back of these within our lifetimes. But I'm an optimist. So. <laughs> okay. Do we have any more questions? It was quite obvious in self-explanatory, so I think people just. <laughs> okay, well, I'll, I'll assume you're not being sarcastic. <laughs> <laughs>